Okay, welcome everybody to the City Council Committee of the Home Retreat, Saturday, May 6th at 9, 10 a.m. Uh, we have lots of items on our agenda this morning, uh, but we are going to start with public comments. And so I realize I haven't created quite a space, but I think there is a chair down there if you would like to join us so that you can camera. <laughs> I can camera. Camera yes. is a verb. Yes, camera is a verb this morning. Thank you. Grammar. Okay, camera is a verb. My name's Connie Marsh. I live on Squawk, and I actually don't. I don't know if I. Yes, I. Um. So. Your agenda is so immense that it blew my brain, and Corey and I had like a six-hour conversation between yesterday and today on this agenda, which helped me congeal down to the usual topics, which is, what are the problems that we're trying to solve, right? And so, uh, what are the problems? Well, they're different to the community than they are to the city, right? They're different entities. City Council is supposed to be representing the community. And then the administration is supposed to be trying to figure out how to run the city given those directions, right? And so um, when I read this, it's, it's uh, the city wants money. This is, this is the summary of what we got. The city wants money from a community who feels that they don't particularly get good info with a, a big gap with the lack of the Issaquah press, which I thought was interesting. Um, and they don't feel they're already getting a big bang for the buck for what they're getting. And uh, so it feels like the city is already costing them too much, but in general, they like the city, right? And so, uh, is this going to translate into success in getting the administration money to do projects that the community doesn't seem to have emphasized as super important to them in a direct way? So it is it is very hard to interpret this into bond support, which in the meeting on Monday, that's what you're looking at. And so this feels very, very much what this meeting is about, even though that's not terribly implied. So then you go into whether, uh, how you've measured success, though success is not really defined in your measurements and never has been. And um, so when you go to see why the community is responding the way it is, I think that is where you can gather what success is and I just don't think time, like we need a, a, a short term measure of success. I don't know that time has much to do with that initially. I think you need to say, well, really and truly, what is success? So I wanted to give um, an example of something that I, I think success is not real. I don't think doing doing a project is necessarily going to ever gain you success because it may be education that will get you progress on congestion and traffic flow because that is not really a solvable problem. But the city has done a, a very minor job of teaching people about what traffic congestion is, how solvable it is, and then the alternatives of, 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 helping with that traffic flow situation. So for example, um, when you uh, ask a question, do you drive more or less than last year, right? And if you aren't driving as much, is it because you got great internet fiber stuff so you can be much more remote? Is it because you now love to walk because the walking experience in this urban environment is dynamic and you wanna do it every day because you see something different, which is what helps with walking. Does your bike riding feel safe? And is it direct? Are you saving time? Or are you recreationally biking? So what is it that would make you not drive and be happy about not driving? And so these measuring parameters don't really get to the reason why people don't drive. 
And so I think when you create them, you have to look at it in a different way. It's not what projects can we do to satisfy? So that's that old satisfy or dissatisfy. We had it in college, right? Um, and part of satisfaction, to my mind, in a community is giving the community control. What do I do when I find a homeless person that is screaming obscenities at the top of their lungs in the park and my 94-year-old mother can even hear him without her hearing aids in, right? You try calling, you get put to a voice message. Okay, even though I know the number, I don't feel like I have control over that situation. Um, the nonprofits are increasingly getting fingers into the nonprofits, telling them how they should be doing their work if they're getting city funding when the nonprofits are there to prevent the city from having to invest in those nonprofits and still have the job be done. So in that situation, you get more bang for the buck if you allow others to do the work and then the community can gather around others. So not everything is the city responsibility. And I'm done. <laughs> Clearly. <laughs> That was a very gentle retail. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> just gives us energy for the rest of our meeting. And so it just said that I tried to not. Uh, no, it, it, it fired me up. I appreciate it. Um, so, since we are not live, I assume we don't have anybody online. We, we do have a, a public facing link here, okay. um, but so far we don't. We just have a, the consultant with us. No matter okay, what. fantastic. So appreciate the community comments. <clears throat> what to think about. So um, just want to take a moment to kind of come back to what our purpose is here. Dale, it looks like you've got kind of an intro type thing that we'll end up getting into. Just wanted to really quickly tell everybody we're going to synthesize a lot of data here today and our goal is to ultimately utilize a lot of this really new data from both the community survey and the performance measures into a little bit of information that we hope will help the administration as they come into the mid-biennium budget and then also the future year biennium budget. Um, so with that, yeah. excellent. Good morning, everyone. Uh, Dale Murky Crimp, even though my slide only has my maiden name on it, who knows what that means. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I'm her Dale. <laughs> Uh, we're going to dive right in. Uh, Council President Walsh just summed this up nicely, but I wanted to give us a little bit of an orientation towards the first half of the day today. Um, as we're con continuously seeking to implement this citywide work cycle, spring invites us to learn a bit more about how we're performing as a city. And in every other year, our com community's perspective through the community survey on how we're doing how are we doing as a city organization? How are we doing as a community as a whole? This morning, we're going to spend our time in three ways outlined here. We're going to engage in and discuss the results of our biennial community survey, specifically the changes we've seen since 2021. Second, we're going to engage in and discuss our performance on the citywide performance measurement plan and whether or not we're measuring the right stuff aligned to the desired future and outcomes for the city of Issaquah. And lastly, but certainly not least, um, number three, all of those inputs will lead to a rich discussion about mid-biennial prioritization, which will be led by Council President Walsh and Deputy Council President Paul. As you saw in your agenda for today, uh, we're gonna start off with a community survey. Uh, <clears throat> Jason Morado, who's on the line, I'll turn it over to momentarily, is gonna give a brief presentation and then we'll have time for question and answer um, and some quick discussion before a break. Then we'll spend about 40 minutes diving into our performance measurement, specifically the performance in 22, and this question around outputs. Are we, are we looking at the right stuff? And I'll talk more about that when we get there. And then lastly, a conversation around mid-biennial prioritization. And then we'll close out with some next steps. Are there any questions before I turn it over to our survey administrator? Well, I'll just say after we close out, we've got 
one a lot and then we've got our cip bus tour so don't think you're getting out of here at 11 <laughs> excellent so i will uh turn it over to jason jason you should be able to share your screen um jason Morado is the um Vice President and Director of Community Research at the ATC Institute. Uh, here he is on the line. And Jason, let me know if you have any challenges. Nope, no challenges, Jeremy. We're ready to go. Yeah, I think I'm all set. Um, thanks, Dale. Can everyone hear me okay? <clears throat> yes, we can. Okay, great. <clears throat> My name is Jason Morado. I'm the Director of Community Research at ETC Institute. And we are a marketing and research firm that specializes in conducting community surveys for local governments. And we just finished for the second time conducting a community survey for the city of Issaquah. So today I'm gonna go through the key findings from the survey. The full report I'm sure you've seen is very detailed and comprehensive. So today I'm gonna give an overview of our key findings I'm at a fairly high level. I do have just one slide about ETC Institute. We're based in the Kansas City area, but we're a national leader in providing market research for local governments. We've been doing this type of work for over 40 years. And in the last 10 years alone, we've conducted surveys in more than a thousand communities across the country. So this is really the type of work that we specialize in. <coughs> This is just a quick rundown of what I'll go through today. I'll go over the purpose and methodology of the survey, um, talk about what we learned from the survey, go through the major findings, and then as Dale said, I'll be able to uh, answer any questions as well. <clears throat> so there are several reasons to conduct a survey like this. One is to get an objective assessment of how satisfied your residents are with the delivery of major city services and to determine what residents feel are the top priorities for the community. We're also able to measure trends from previous surveys. Um, a lot of these questions were the same ones we asked um, on your previous survey in 2021. And then we're also able to compare your results with other communities across the country. Um, that's based on surveys conducted by ETC Institute. <laughs> So this survey was, <clears throat> excuse me, seven pages in length, um, <clears throat> the printed version of it. And that's a pretty typical length for a community survey. The survey was administered by a combination of mail and online to randomly select a residence throughout the city. And that's our standard methodology for these community surveys. We had a good response. We ended up with 636 completed surveys. Our goal was to get at least 600. And the results of these 636 surveys at the 95% level of confidence has a margin of error of plus or minus 3.9%. So essentially that means that if we conducted this survey the same way 100 times, 95 times the results would be plus or minus 3.9% uh, from what we're reporting. So the results are never perfect, but the margin of error is small. <coughs> Here we have a map of the city. The red dots are households that completed a survey. So we had a good distribution throughout the, uh, throughout the city. And this is similar to the distribution we had on your previous survey. Um, and as we were administering the survey, we monitor the demographics of survey respondents to ensure that they reflect the actual population of the city. Um, so we made sure that the demographics of survey respondents in key areas such as race and ethnicity, gender and age, um, really do reflect the actual population of the city. So here are key findings from the survey. We found that residents have a very positive perception of the city. 97% um, of respondents rated Issaquah as an excellent or a good place to live, and 94% rated Issaquah as an excellent or a good place to raise children. And these numbers are significantly higher than most, uh, most other communities that we survey. We also found that satisfaction with city services is much higher in Issaquah than other cities. We'll look at this in a little more detail in a little bit, um, but you rate above the US average in 34 out of the 39 areas that we compared. And one of the areas where you rate the farthest above the national average is customer service from city employees, um, where you were 31 percentage points above the US average. When we compare these results to 2021, um, overall, the satisfaction ratings are similar to a couple of years ago. Um, which is a good thing for a couple reasons. Uh, one is that your satisfaction ratings were very high in 2021. 
And then also, most cities that we've surveyed over the past six to eight months have seen an overall decrease in satisfaction over the past couple of years. Um, so you're definitely going against a trend by having similar satisfaction to what you had a couple of years ago. <clears throat> and then the top overall priorities, and we'll look at this in more detail in a little bit as well. Um, top overall priorities, traffic flow, land use planning and zoning, uh, street sidewalks and infrastructure, and police services. But first, we'll look at some general perceptions residents have of the city. This was the very first question on the survey. <clears throat> we asked residents to rate their perceptions of the city in a number of different ways. You can see the dark blue are ratings excellent. The light blue is good. The gray is neutral, and we interpret neutral as meeting expectations. Um, it's a rating of a three on the five-point scale. And then the pink and red are those who uh, ratings of below average or poor. <clears throat> so overall, the positive ratings far outweigh the negative. Uh, for those top five items, over 90% of respondents gave positive ratings. So that's the overall quality of life from Issaquah. Issaquah is a place to live and it's a place to raise children. Um, respondents' neighborhood as a place to live received very, very high ratings. And then the overall image of Issaquah. On this question, we asked residents to rate how satisfied they are with major categories of city services. So here we're asking residents to rate these areas at the big picture departmental level. And then later on in the survey, we asked about some more specific areas within some of these categories. Um, so once again, overall, the positive ratings far outweigh the negative. If you look at the top of this chart, the highest rated areas are fire and ambulance, parks and recreation, trash recycling and yard waste, and police services. There's only one area that had more negative ratings than positive, and that was traffic flow and congestion, um, which is very common for a city that has grown as fast as yours over the past 10 years. Um, so that's not that's not unusual. <clears throat> and then here we asked about satisfaction with different aspects of city leadership and services. One of the things that stood out to me here is how few residents were dissatisfied with any of these areas. Um, for most of these, less than 10% of residents were either dissatisfied or very dissatisfied. If you look at the top of this chart, the highest rated area was customer service from Issaquah employees. And then one of the things that really stood out to me on this chart is this second row, quality of local governmental services. This is one of the most important questions on the survey <clears throat> because here we're asking the residents to take into account all the services that you're providing and really give an overall satisfaction rating for how well you're doing. And there was nearly a 10 to one ratio of satisfied versus dissatisfied responses with the overall quality of local government services. Um, typically that ratio is around four or five to one. So your rating was far better than that. Here we have a map of the city and we broke the results out by census block group. Um, so these are very small areas. We did this for every question on the survey asked on a five point scale. So there are over a hundred maps in the report. And this tells us if residents in different parts of the city rate services differently or of different perceptions of the city. So this map is for how respondents feel about their neighborhood as a place to live. You can see the entire map is blue. Um, in fact, a lot of it is dark blue, which is the highest possible rating. And this means that residents in all parts of the city are satisfied with their neighborhood as a place to live. <laughs> This map shows how residents feel about Issaquah as a place to raise children. And again, not only is the entire map blue, but most of it is dark blue, being that residents throughout the city um, feel that Issaquah is an excellent or a good place to raise children. So I mentioned earlier that satisfaction with city services is much higher in Issaquah and other communities. We rated above the U.S. average in 34 out of the 39 areas that we compared. And that includes 30 of those areas where your ratings were significantly higher. So in other words, 5% or more above the national average. So for these next few charts, the dark blue line are <clears throat> Issaquah residents who are either satisfied or very satisfied. The gray are the satisfaction ratings for residents throughout the Northwest region. So that includes the state of Washington as well as surrounding states. And then the light blue are the satisfaction ratings from all across the country. And this is based on a national survey that ETC Institute conducts on an annual basis. So this first charts for perceptions of the city. 
you can see your ratings are far above the national average in all these areas, um, especially when it comes to as a place to live, as a place to raise children, and the overall image of the city. Um, <clears throat> I mentioned earlier that 97% of respondents rated Issaquah as an excellent or a good place to live. And that's almost double the national average of 50%. This charts for major categories of city services. Uh, you can see in most areas, your ratings are significantly above other communities. That includes parks, recreation, trash recycling, yard waste, water and wastewater, streets, sidewalks, infrastructure. Um, We'll see that that's a street sidewalks infrastructure is a high priority for residents, uh, but that doesn't mean you're doing a, a bad job. In fact, your ratings are far above the national average. Um, community preparedness and then communication with the public are also areas where you rate far above the national average. The only area that rates below is traffic flow. Um, now this number has improved over the last few surveys. This year, 32% were satisfied. In 2021, it was 29%. If you go back to 2017, only 18% were satisfied. Um, so it is moving in the right direction. <clears throat> For infrastructure and mobility, uh, you can see in most areas, your ratings are significantly above the national average. And you can see that includes a variety of different types of services. For leadership and services in the community, <clears throat> again, your ratings are above the national average in most of these areas. Um, I mentioned earlier, one of the areas where you rate the farthest above the national average is customer service from city employees. You had a 72% satisfaction rating, and you can see both the regional and national average are 41%. Another area that stands out is that about two thirds of respondents were satisfied with the overall quality of local government services. Um, again, that's one of the most important questions on the survey because it, it kind of sums up how well you're doing overall. And the national average is only 51%. One more area to point out here is this bottom row. 48% uh, of respondents are satisfied with the value they receive for tax dollars and fees. Now that might seem like a low number compared to the other uh, ratings you had on other services, but you can see the regional and national average are only at 34 and 36%. Um, so 48% satisfaction rating is actually a, a good number for this question. And then for public safety, um, in a lot of these areas, you're on par with other communities. Your ratings are higher uh, when it comes to the overall feeling of safety and then the overall quality of police protection. Um, however, efforts to prevent crime is a little bit below the national average. I mentioned that overall, the satisfaction ratings are similar to 2021, um, which is a good thing because the ratings were very high back then. And then most cities have had overall a decrease in satisfaction over the past couple of years. Um, I won't read this whole list to you, but these are the areas that had the biggest increases in satisfaction since 2021. So just, you know, ISQA is a place to open a business, um, efforts to address salmon recovery, which is an interesting one, um, opportunities to attend cultural arts and music activities. Um, so those are just the biggest improvements. These are the areas with the biggest decrease in satisfaction since your last survey. A lot of this is related to public safety and police services, which is a trend we've seen all over the country the past couple of years. Um, so not, not necessarily a huge surprise. So now we'll take a look at top priorities. Earlier, we saw satisfaction with major categories of city services. As a follow-up question to that, we asked which of these services should receive the most emphasis from city leaders over the next two years? And residents could pick which three of these they felt should receive the most emphasis. So which are the most important? The highest priority was traffic flow, followed by land use, planning, and zoning, uh, maintenance of city street sidewalks and infrastructure, and then police was the fourth highest priority. <clears throat> now, this is something we call the important satisfaction matrix. Um, you might remember this from a couple of years ago. So this analysis is based on two different types of data. We asked residents how satisfied they are with the services, and then we asked which of those services should receive the most emphasis from city leaders. So which are the most important? Now, if you go to the right of this chart, <clears throat> those are the areas that residents rated as the most important. And as you move left, the importance gets less and less. If you look at the top of this matrix, those are the items residents are the most satisfied with. And as you move down the matrix, the satisfaction gets less and less. 
So these items in this bottom right-hand quadrant where it says opportunities for improvement, those are the ones that have that combination <clears throat> excuse me, of lower satisfaction, but highest importance. Um, so those are the ones that really we recommend as the highest priorities to emphasize over the next couple of years. If you look in the quadrant above that, continued emphasis, residents also think these areas are important, um, but the satisfaction levels are, are higher. Um, so you certainly want to maintain that level of uh, emphasis since residents feel these are important, even though the satisfaction is already relatively high. This quadrant hurts is exceeding expectations. Um, residents um, are satisfied with these items um, and they don't rate them as being quite as important as some of the areas to the right. Um, so you really are exceeding resident expectation in this quadrant. And in this bottom left hand quadrant, um, the satisfaction ratings are lower in this area as well, um, but um, residents also are not rating these as quite as important as other areas. So this first quadrant is for major city services. You can see in the bottom right hand corner, we have traffic flow and land use planning and zoning. Those also were in this quadrant on your last survey as high priorities. Um, residents also feel it's important to focus on police services, uh, maintaining street sidewalks infrastructure, uh, community preparedness, and then efforts to sustain environmental quality, um, although the satisfaction is higher in those areas than it is in the items in the red. This is for mobility. You can see in the bottom right-hand quadrant, we have traffic calming measures and then ease of travel by public transportation. Um, other areas that are a high priority are the availability of paths and walking trails and then ease of travel by car. For growth and development, you can see the two high priority areas are how well is supposed to plan for future growth and the availability of affordable quality housing. Um, affordable housing has been a, a really a high priority over the past year or so, especially that that's shown up in a lot of communities as a high priority. Last time it wasn't in this quadrant. Um, quality of new development in Issaquah was in this bottom quadrant last time. And it, you see it just missed being in that quadrant again this time, which is barely um, in the continued em emphasis quadrant. For environmental stewardship, um, <clears throat> efforts to address climate change and global warming is the one that falls into this quadrant. Um, last time there was nothing in here uh, addressing climate change, which is barely on this side of the line, but now it's a little bit of a higher priority. Can we go back to the last slide? We have a quick question there. Yeah, okay. sure. Yeah, just a clarification. So, because I feel like, and I'm not trying to be defensive, but I feel like we put a lot of emphasis on, uh, you know, climate change and, you know, we have our climate change plan and, and all that. So when respondents are answering that question, are they just saying, uh, don't forget this, or this is where we want you to emphasize, even though we've already done quite a bit in that area, or is this an area where they feel we haven't done enough? So, so there's two aspects to this. For these eight items, we asked residents how satisfied they were with each one of these. Um, now this had the lowest satisfaction rating among these eight items. Um, and then we asked, which of these should receive the most emphasis from city leaders over the next couple of years. And it ranked kind of in the middle of importance, it ranked fourth. Um, so that combination of kind of mid-level importance and lower satisfaction is what put it into this quadrant. Last time it was just, it was similar last time, but it was just a little to the left of this line. Um, so level of importance has gone up just a little bit uh, from the last survey. I believe the satisfaction rating though was uh, similar. <laughs> And one more question, comment. Well, um, I I've seen surveys also about the importance of this, or the um, how the uh, it's more on people's minds now, especially with um, more disasters like fires in California, um, forest fires, and so I think that that may also be reflecting a, a general trend about increased awareness of um, climate change and people ranking it as more important, or just generally, yeah. Generally, yeah. Thank you. One more. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I I don't know if this would uh, complicate your charts or not, but uh, from my point of view, it might have been helpful to uh, give a reference dot 
in another color to show where this particular item was. And then the blue dot shows where it is so that we can kind of get a visual picture of, of where we're getting better and, and where things are kind of trending. I know you have those trends in, in many of the charts, but um, for some of us that are visual learners, it might be helpful. Um, yeah, I mean, we could do something like that. Um, <clears throat> the thing you have to weigh is would it become too messy to read and too cluttered but but Absolutely. i would be but i agree that would, that's yeah that that's a good idea and that is something that that we could do so. okay go ahead <clears throat> okay um yeah so this chart has a lot going on with it this is for social and economic vitality this was just a longer question on the survey um you can see in the bottom right hand quadrant um we have cost of living uh, support for those in need, and then services that promote cultural awareness, diversity, inclusion um, are the highest priorities. Um, and those were, I believe, that those were similar to the highest priorities on your last survey as well, those same ones. For city leadership and services, um, just general value received for local tax dollars and fees, that's always a high priority. Uh, efforts to encourage community engagement, then accessibility of information about city services and programs. Um, efforts to engage in diverse communities um, just barely miss falling into this quadrant. You see it's, it's close to the line. Then when it comes to infrastructure, <clears throat> the highest priorities are street repair, uh, sidewalks, street lighting, condition of pavement markings on streets, and then the availability of electric vehicle charging stations. <clears throat> When we look at public safety, um, a number of these areas in this quadrant are ones that had a, a decrease in satisfaction since your last survey. Um, visibility of police in neighborhoods, as well as commercial and retail areas, just general efforts to prevent crime, uh, response to situations involving individuals with cognitive or mental challenges, and then response to property crime. <laughs> So that is everything that I had. Just a, a quick recap. Obviously, residents have a very positive perception of the city. Uh, there's a lot of examples of that throughout the report. Um, satisfaction of city services, just like last time, is much higher than other communities, uh, with customer service being one of the really one of the many areas that really stood out. Um, overall, the level of satisfaction is similar to a couple of years ago, um, which is a good thing compared to what we've seen in other cities. And then the top overall priorities, we saw a lot of priorities as we looked at the different categories, but big picture overall, traffic flow, land use planning and zoning, street sidewalks infrastructure, and police services. Um, so with that, does anyone have any, any questions, any comments? Okay, questions. Oh, this is um, sort of a methodology question. Um, so you did the groupings by, you know, fours and fives were, you know, good, good to grade and, you know, uh, ones and two, twos were bad. Have you ever used the net promoter score, which I think provides a, actually a truer um, view of what people's sentiments are? Because people tend to be pretty uh, easy graders. Um, and net promoter basically says if you get a five, that's good. If you get a one, two or three, that's bad. And if you're a four, that's neutral. Um, and it, it, it changes, I suspect it might change the results because I think we're painting a rosier picture for ourselves than really exists in the city. So, um, so anyway, just, just, just a thought if you've ever done it, but it's, it's most product marketing people do net promoter score versus, uh, you know, goods and grades versus, you know, bads and awfuls. So just your thoughts on that. Yeah, we, we no, we haven't really done that. I am somewhat familiar with it. Um, we do some transportation studies where we experiment with that a little bit. Um, I, I'm not too familiar with it because I wasn't super involved, but it seemed like, um, I don't know, it just wasn't something that we thought we should necessarily move to um, for these types of surveys. Um, well, it, 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 it really does skew up the uh, um, comparing last to next. I mean, if you know, because it changes the numbers, but. Um, it, um, and I might just do this just for giggles for myself is to do a compare of what net promoter score looks like. Cause I mean, we've got the data. So fives are promoters, three, fours yeah. and fives are detractors, two, ones, twos and threes are detractors. Um, it'd be just interesting to see what it does to the numbers. 
Yeah, yeah. And, and for these types of surveys, um, that I mean, that would be probably that would be an interesting to take a look at. But this does seem to be more kind of the uh, industry standard for for satisfaction city satisfaction surveys for city yeah. services. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yes. Um, so 2021. I mean, we are, we still do have the effects of COVID, but 2021 there were more effects of COVID, and I'm wondering if you've seen. Um, I remember having this question when we looked at the 2021 survey about how that might affect um, people's perception of things during that survey. So I'm wondering if you've seen trends or things you think we should be aware of that you've seen across all of the country and all the surveys that you, you've looked at that you think are influenced by um, by COVID and the um, economic impacts of that lockdown so, or um, stay home. That's right. Yeah, um, well, we have seen just a general decrease in satisfaction over the past year or two, especially. Um, and I think that's related to a number of things. Um, it just seems like in general, people are are angrier, more, more dissatisfied, more opinionated with a lot of different things. There's a lot more angst and just tension throughout the country for a number of reasons. Um, not necessarily COVID related anymore, but really a lot of things going on. Um, I mean, I would say I would say about eighty percent of the communities we've surveyed over the past six to eight months have had uh, just an overall decrease in satisfaction compared to twenty twenty one and twenty twenty. Um, so this is, as I mentioned, this is a positive thing, really, that overall your satisfaction ratings are similar to what they were a couple of years ago. Obviously, some specific areas were different. Uh, police services there were there were decreases in a number of areas there. Um, but that's also a trend that we've seen, you know, nationwide. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation and all the work. Um, similar to Councilmember D. Michelle's question, uh, there are a lot of responses um, or answers that end up in the most satisfied and the needs most emphasis. Um, there are quite a few examples of that, and I'm just wondering, you know, how we should be. Uh, is that um, I mean, could that be thought of in a different way or is there kind of a standard way? So like my initial thought was, oh, OK, maybe it means like you're on the right track or maybe it means it's I'm satisfied, but you can always be doing more. But how should we be thinking about that kind of dynamic, that overlapping dynamic? Yeah, one well, example may be like um, <clears throat> like police services. Um, the, 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 the satisfaction was relatively high. Um, but it still was an area that residents feel is important to emphasize. Um, and that's actually very common for police services in a lot of communities. Um, <clears throat> even if the sad, really almost regardless of the satisfaction level with police services, that's always something residents feel is important to emphasize, um, which makes it a high priority. Um, but notice it didn't fall into that bottom right-hand quadrant because the satisfaction temp level was really high. Um, that's really safe for those areas that have that combination of low satisfaction, um, but also the most important. Um, that upper right-hand quadrant continued emphasis, um, I think of the areas you're talking about where the satisfaction is high, but it's still something residents feel is important. Um, so they do want you to continue to continue to emphasize and maintain the level of service for the area items in that quadrant. Okay, um, so Thank you, Jason, very much. Um, I think at this point our questions are done, so we're just going to go into a little bit of general feedback and thoughts on that. We've got about five-ish minutes, maybe <laughs> ten. We can take more than that. Yeah, we'll, we'll see. We'll see. Um, because part of this is going to be, okay, we're receiving the um, – community sentiment through the survey. And then we're also going to take a look at the performance measurement. Again, ultimately, we're looking down to how do we synthesize all of that together with the mid-biennial prioritization, um, which is going to take all of those inputs together. So any general thoughts that we want to emphasize from all of this? I just have one more question. Get, yeah, go ahead. I apologize. Um, I'm looking at uh, the availability availability of affordable quality housing, um, and just a question in terms of the methodology. When we're talking about affordable housing, are we talking about housing that is affordable for people 
that earn kind of the average uh, 100% uh, rate in the city? Or are we talking about affordable housing being the supplemental housing at zero to 30% AMI or zero to 80% AMI? Which affordable housing are, did, did you study there? Well, we weren't real specific with that question. I think it was just, I'm trying to find the question on the survey, but I believe it was just, um, it just had this word there in the, sur um, in the report, availability of affordable housing. Um, so it's just kind of a general perceptions question. Um, you know, for something like that, we could always run a cross tab and see what the results are um, for different income levels. Um, but really, we're just kind of touching on that at a broad level. We didn't get real specific with that category. Okay, because I think when you, when, you, when you say income levels, we're not necessarily talking about the um, income level of the people that already live here. I think we're talking about what type of housing we want to bring in. If it's affordable housing that's kind of by the state or by the county or, or government, then it's a, a type of housing that's available for people at certain income levels that might not be in our community yet. So I, I know it's a difficult concept to kind of capture. I was just wondering how, how you um, put that together and that, that, that answer is helpful. Thank you. Okay, sure. Yeah, and that's something you could do really your own, the whole entire survey really just built around that. That is definitely a complex <laughs> issue. And yeah, we're really just kind of, yeah, scratching the surface here uh, with, the, with that. So. Chris Van Barb. Um, I think that's a really good question. And I would love to see a cross tab by, by, by income and age um, yeah. to see what, the, what the, that looked like, because I think that would provide some insights. Because I, I think everybody's reading that question how they want to read that question. So the, the results are probably not the same across the board. So Dale's had something. Good. All right. Awesome. Great. Right. Uh, yeah, just uh, plus plus one on that. And there were several areas where I thought, gee, I'd love to <clears throat> dig deeper into affordable housing was, was one of them. Um, when we talk about traffic flow and congestion, where I live, I'm thinking, well, that's Front Street. But maybe if you're in the Highlands, you're thinking, well, that's, you know, the... Main and there are geographic maps for that yeah. that were added uh, a little oh, bit later. So you want to make sure to go back. Okay. Yeah. But at any rate, there were, you know, quality of uh, how we're supporting people. Um, yeah, I forget the exact wording, but how we're supporting people in poverty, basically. Um, again, there's a lot that we're doing. We've done, we're doing a lot more now than we were two years ago. So to dig down in that, well, what are people seeing that they think we're not doing enough? Um, there was a lot of those broadband questions that I thought it'd be great to have a focus group or it'd be great to just mm -hmm. go out and talk to people and find out, well, just a little bit more, you know, what exactly are you talking about? Because it's hard to target things on these great big broad issues. Land use was one where it's like, what do you want us to do? <laughs> so, anyway, just uh, disagree. Yeah, that was something that I also had was looking at the land use planning and zoning and dissatisfaction. I don't know if that means people think there are too many apartments or not enough apartments, right. or if our code is too difficult to understand or that housing is too expensive. And so that's that's one that I struggle with. I think also um, for those who might not have seen the latest update in the packet, the comments um, that we received on there was very insightful. I thought it was really interesting to see how many people still mentioned that the loss of the escort press mm -hmm. was really important. So I wonder if this is a side note we should do of the newsletter and maybe increase information that's included there because it really seems like people want to be more connected <laughs> city services. Anybody else on general thoughts? Yeah. Uh, well, I think there's a lot of really good things and I wanted to make sure to say that <laughs> off the bat um, and also the city services, so all of the city staff that have done a great job with customer service that leaped out, which is great. And thank you to all the hardworking city staff for that. Um, I think for me, communication and engagement, I don't know if it's the newsletter because the newsletter 
I don't think is getting the message out to everyone on what we're doing in a number of areas. So I think maybe we need to try other ways of getting that information out. But um, that seems to be a through line uh, on a number of topics in the survey. Um, I think we could more on communication on what we are doing for public safety um, and more information about what people can do to um, protect their property as well as what we're doing um, on the public safety <clears throat> side with our police department as well as all of the good work that we're doing with the human services department in conjunction with the police and, and just make sure to get the word out about all of that. Um, I also think there's a big opportunity here to move in information about what we're doing on the climate change front. I think people are, I, my read on that was that people are increasingly finding that important and recognizing the importance of that. I think that's also reflected in national surveys and um, surveys across the board that it's growing, people are growing the awareness of how important that is. And we are, we have done a lot in that area. So I think communicating about that and also communicating about um, both public safety and climate change, one of the overlapping concerns are disaster preparedness. Um, so fire, you know, we're right, we have a lot of neighborhoods right at the interface between the wildland and the urban areas. So we could really, I think, do a lot more communication around with our emergency preparedness manager, new staff member, um, a lot more communication around how to prepare for all of that. So that was really my, my, the theme that jumped out to me is that we're doing a lot of work in a lot of these areas that people feel are opportunities for improvement and a lot of it could be improved um, if we communicate more and engage more and maybe it's social media and maybe we need to try different ways of getting this information out to people because I think we do have some methods that can meet or that's an opportunity improvement. So, um, yeah, that's, I think we can do more on the communication front. Two things that I noticed that I interpret as people noticing our efforts or changes in our services. Um, we saw significant improvements in the areas of equity and diversity, equity, and inclusion, any of those. It showed that people are much more satisfied. And I think we can see that having created the equity mission and talking a lot about more about that and how it affects our services is important. The other thing is people expressed a decrease in visibility of police in neighborhoods and commercial areas. And honestly, for me, that is actually pretty positive because it says when we had to consolidate our police existing people in with training people and there were fewer vehicles on people noticed that and now that we're able to split out and we have those people trained up in their own vehicles they're also going to notice that um so from my perspective that that shows that people were paying attention to those areas i also wanted to note um the relatively high number of people that are telecommuting, 21%, which was down from 25% in 2021, but still stronger than I think we anticipated. And then also the new questions on electric vehicle ownership at 14% with 27% interested. So there's a lot of really useful, interesting information in there. So Dale, is there anything else you wanted to highlight? You, you all touched on some of the, the, I would say, both questions, I think, specifically around this, uh, this. This survey instrument is meant to give us broad strokes, but isn't necessarily meant to tell us some of the specifics. I think the specifics, Councilmember Joe, that you brought up around, like, what, when you say affordable housing, what do people mean? What do they think? I think similar, Councilmember D. Michelle, you, you raised a similar point. Right? Like, what is this really asking and how are people really interpreting it? Um, and I think one thing that wasn't mentioned in this report, but it's good to know, is that we asked respondents if they're willing to be followed up with um, for a focus group conversation or something like that. And so there is potential to do that, to keep the conversation going. So, yeah. yeah um, just an odd follow up. I know we did the statistically valid random sample yep. study, and that's what we're looking at. We also did the blasted out. Did you see um, any kind of, were the results radically different or similar or have you looked at them? 
haven't looked at them yet. Uh, we, we kept the survey open as long as we could. Mm -hmm. uh, Jason probably has the final number, but we, we got an additional over 200 surveys. Um, those surveys will likely trend um, a certain way demographically that is not necessarily representative of the community uh, as a whole, but we'll take a look at those. Jason will be sending me the raw data files for both the statistically valid and the general survey. And so we'll be able to do some of that cross-tab analysis um, and also compare the two. Jason, I don't know if you have anything you want to add on that. Yeah, well, yeah, you covered it well, Dale. Um, yeah, we're processing those general public survey results now. So we should have those available by the middle of next week. Um, I don't know if I have the very final number yet, but it was over 200 completed surveys, which is a which is a really high number, um, definitely much higher than we often see. Um, so people are definitely interested. Um, the other thing I was going to mention is that we're also updating the dashboard. Um, this is back to the statistically valid survey data. Um, so that'll allow you to really dig deeper into the results and some of the ways you've talked about running the cross tabs. We, we can run them as well separately, but then also on your own, if you wanted to, you could run cross tabs, compare the results of 2021, which is some of that in the report, but it'll even be a little bit easier to access that with the dashboard. Um, so that, be, that should be ready in the next couple of weeks. We're working on that now as well. Thanks, Jason. Great. Uh, Barb Victoria or? Victoria. Okay, okay. Victoria. Well, I'm not saying anything you don't know about it. Uh, the people that choose the opt to follow up to be followed up that makes you yeah. yes to a certain demographic so, yeah be be wary of that like yeah just uh, and again it was a, a wonderful survey and lots of good data I was just I you could spend hours reading through it um, I did, I was concerned about how are we reaching out to people who are non English speakers. And so just a thought for the future. I know that that's hard work. I know it's hard work to, to get those people to, to participate, but perhaps um, when we're getting ready for the next survey, bring the equity board in and see if they can help us uh, with how to reach out to uh, those communities. All right. Yep. Zach? Um, just one more thing I wanted to add that I thought was interesting. Um, Looking at the slides for um, or the parts of the report that have to do with annual household income and also housing costs, and then look, just looking at census data, um, the annual median income of $120,000 a year is what it is for here in Issaquah for household income, which is close to how it showed up in the um, survey. And you know, just knowing that a cost per unit household, pay, household pays more than 30% of their total household income on housing um, at $10,000 a month, then that there's about 50% of respondents are saying that their cost per unit or their housing costs, yeah. which of course would shake out differently, it's just average. But um, I think that's concerning. It's something that we need to kind of be mindful of and, and think about as we uh, approach. Maybe I'll bring that up again later. But again, just an interesting piece of information. Okay, I think we're going to thank you, Jason. Much appreciated. Always tons of useful information on all of that. I think we're going to take our five minute break and then come back for the performance measurement conversation. Great. Great. Thank you. Thanks, thanks everyone. Thank you, Jason. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Fantastic. Okay, so we are coming back um, from our break, switching from community perception and survey to data, 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 internal, all of the things. So, Dale, right. it's your, your gig. Indeed. Um, so now we've got a little bit of an understanding of how residents feel. We want to take a look down from that high, those high level indicators to what are we doing and producing as a city organization that corresponds to that experience. That's the purpose of our performance measurement plan. How well are we doing those things? How effectively are we producing them, whether that's programs, activities, 
for services. Um, as outlined in the performance measurement plan and in the memo in your packet for today, performance measurement is, I think most simply put, the process of collecting, analyzing, and reporting on data and information about what an organization does, um, how well it does it, and how that impacts broader social condition. So it's a tool to help us evaluate the quantity, the quality, the effectiveness of what we do. Essentially, what are we doing? How well are we doing it? And what is it leading to? Um, and I would add, how do we know that we're doing it well? Another thing that was outlined um, in the performance update in your packet was that we hit some significant milestones in 2022 for our performance measurement plan. We have 100% of the data for our performance measures either submitted or with planned submission for this year. So as you all know, there's some data that we get from other organizations, whether that's PSRC or SAP Transit or WashDOT, and some of that data comes on a delay. So it's not ready for us in the first quarter because they're still looking at two quarters ago. But by the end of this year, we will have 100% of data for all of our 2022 measures. We've also reduced the number of measures that have a goal or a target that's to be determined from 18 in 2019 to only five in 2022 as of right now. And I would add, it'll look more closely like two will be TBD. Um, the reason there are five that are TBD is that we're waiting for some of that data. So you, we can't know if we hit the target or the goal until we have the data itself. And that we saw a particular strength um, in our infrastructure, environmental stewardship, and social and economic vitality goal areas on our measurement, on our, the data on our measures and our performance. And we saw some progress um, that I think was notable in city leadership services. Simply put, at this point in time, we have clarity on how we're doing, and now we need to focus on improving how we're doing. This likely entails departments analyzing the root causes for the performance um, and making some changes to our approach for certain elements of our work. It also might be worth considering whether some of the targets are the appropriate targets. So we set some of these targets in 2020 based either on 2019 and, and pre-2019 data or based on just best thinking at the time. There were, there were measures for which we had never gathered data before. And so it was really thinking of, it seems like we probably think 60% of people should be satisfied. Um, maybe it's time to revisit those targets and think about whether that they should be different. Um, I expect land use will be a category that we'll want to talk about. It also invites us to consider at this particular juncture, if we're measuring the right outputs to influence the desired change in our outcomes. As outlined in the memo, so this should be a familiar image up here, uh, performance measures can often be sorted into four categories, inputs, actions, outputs, and outcomes. Say it with me, in, actions, outputs. Um, our work is serious, but we shouldn't take ourselves. Uh, within outcomes, we have three categories. And I think this is often overlooked that there are Outcomes we expect to see more immediately. So usually the knowledge of things, we've talked a lot today about education and people having the knowledge of things. That's often a short-term outcome of the programs that we put in place and that we execute. Medium-term outcomes, so usually behavior or sentiment, that's our, our community survey, and long-term outcomes. So we're thinking about the social or economic impact in our community broadly. Inputs and actions are the planned work. They're the resources that we have and what we do with those resources. Outputs and outcomes are the results of our work. The products and the knowledge we create, the community sentiment we influence, the social and economic condition that we support for our work. Our plan, we are rich in outputs and long-term outcomes. We measure a lot of those. And while this framework is simple, this is a simple way to think about this. Uh, everyone here knows that how challenging social, how challenging and complex social change is. So it's not as simple as this framework right here. Our government is one, albeit a very significant, but one actor in creating 
some of the social and economic reality that we experience. However, understanding that there's a connection between what we invest and what we do, what we immediately produce and what people experience, that's important. We have to think that through line all the way through to know if what we're doing is having the intended impact. If we don't have a clear theory of the link between these indicators, then we can be doing a lot of work. And frankly, we can be doing a lot of work very well, but it can be headed in a direction that's not our intended outcome. I think it's important to note, and I know this was mentioned in the, in the materials for today, establishing a trend in performance, even at the output level, can take years, um, a handful of years. Especially, we adopted our performance plan in the middle of a pandemic. Um, our baseline, we might not actually really know our baseline currently. And our true baseline might be shifting a little bit, but that shouldn't mean that we don't take time to ask ourselves, are we measuring the right stuff? The, the memo also outlines some significant gaps. Um, and I know you saw in the memo um, a model like this for each of our goal areas. And we don't measure a lot of short-term outcomes. There are only a handful of them that we look at. Um, this makes sense. Short-term outcomes are often program-level outcomes. They measure the near-term result that we expect to see from a particular program. Um, I think a great example is our community court. Uh, that program is specifically tracking the number of graduates with the intention of reducing the contact those individuals have with the justice system following their experience in the community court. We're looking at the recidivism rate, we're looking for the recidivism rate to decrease. But we're probably not saying, hey, having a community court is going to mean the recidivism rate is going to lower for everyone that touches the justice system. It's really going to focus on the recidivism rate for just that group. And that's a short-term outcome that that program is leading us on the path that hopefully long-term, we would see a reduced recidivism rate for all members of our broader community. That said, um, our data-driven decision-making team, we're gonna have to come up with like a more fun and easy to say name that's not an acronym. Um, we'll be working with departments um, as part of our partnership with What Works Cities to identify programs aligned to our medium and long-term outcomes and determine some of those short-term program outcomes that we can measure. But there is another key question, I think that this particular group now having immersed ourselves in the community survey is set up to consider. Um, and that is, uh, are we measuring the right outputs? Are we measuring the right stuff that we are doing aligned to our medium and long-term outcome goals? It's often said, um, and I should probably have found out who to attribute this quote to, but since I won't quote it directly, it's, it, I'm going to say it's okay. Um, you pay attention to what you measure. And if we're not measuring something and not reporting it, we're potentially not putting the attention on it that we should to improve and to see the experience improve for our residents. With that in mind, um, I'm going to stop talking soon, uh, and I want to open for questions, but also the planned discussion for today. Are we measuring and reporting the right outputs aligned to our medium and long-term goals for each goal area? And, are, and um, if not, what output measures would be a better indicator that we're doing the right work and that we're doing that right work well in alignment with our vision for the city? I'll Pause there. So I'm going to start on the council side and just say, first of all, I think the thing that we may want to recognize with this performance measurement program is how far we've come. How amazing it is to be shifting from a perspective of, hey, can we please get the data? Can we please get the data? Can we please get complete data? to, oh my goodness, we have data, now what do we do with that? And so I want to celebrate maybe a shift in perspective and recognize the success of the program so far in getting us to this point. Um, but I think being able to say, okay, <laughs> now as we're looking at this, did we did we see anything in the community survey that 
identify opportunities for improvement, but maybe lacked some related output measures. Was there anything we saw there just as a starting point of discussion questions? What's missing? Where are the gaps? Anybody? Chris? I didn't get it up. No. Um, I'm not sure that I have an answer to your question at all, but I but it's it's one some some thinking on my part, which is um, kind of we're looking at this track of it starts with the survey. We get some ideas of where we need to focus our attention, and then we come up with some stuff to do. Um, and then how do we? So we've got kind of our ongoing uh, performance measures. Love them to death. But if we say, hey, hey we're going to do an education program around traffic and you know <laughs> congestion how do we measure the effectiveness of that particular initiative on on the result which is the long-term outcome or maybe medium-term outcome of people think that it's easier to get around town or you know or we we do a a sidewalk program on Squ squawk mountain and all of a sudden we now can track the long-term outcome and we see that there's a dark blue box up on Squawk Mountain instead of a light blue box. So anyway, so kind of thinking about our out, I, I loved your thing about inputs, um, outputs, and then the three stages of outcomes, which I've never seen before, but I really like that. But I think it's interesting to think about as we do stuff as a result of the survey and as a result of our planning, how do we measure those specific things versus just uh, business as usual kind of measures that we have that have kind of a longer term run on them. Yeah. Dale, do you want to talk about, we kind of talked about project and program specific measurements and what you're going to be doing this year for that area? Without going, I have tons of, uh, if you want any background reading, you let me know. Um, so without going too deeply into theoretically into all of that, totally agree. I think that we should absolutely be identifying with each program we launch, what we want it to accomplish. And we're then having staff say, okay, this is the this is what we're gonna track. I think some good examples of that besides community core, I think our homeless outreach program does a really good job of that. You can see the dashboard that they have. I mean, that's data that even before that dashboard existed, they said our North Star is people permanently housed and maintaining housing. And here's what we think we can do that's going to impact that. So they have that implicit theory of like, here are the actions we're taking. And they're tracking the number of interactions, the number of goals that are achieved by the folks they interact with. And the hope is that they are seeing and they're constantly getting a clearer idea of that theory for that program to be successful. Mm -hmm. So I think it's a, it's about identifying what are the programs that we think are the things that move the needle. Move the needle, <laughs> yeah. 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 No, and I, I think, um, love that, love that to pieces, but and because we do things that just don't work. I mean, and so how, and the hardest thing in the world, particularly in government, is to stop doing something you started. So that's where the, the data is helpful. It's just like, you know, we're doing a, a whatever program and it's and it just absolutely not moving the needle. Well, let's try something new and let's stop doing that because we have limited resources. So so I think that the data is is probably the only way we can ever kind of squirrel up the courage to stop doing stuff. Absolutely. Great. I was just one follow up there. And you've seen them do that. Uh, you've seen them change their approach mm -hmm. or evolve their approach. So originally just taking referrals from IPD and then thinking, oh, maybe we should be approaching this differently. You've seen a lot of innovation happen within that program as a result of having that constant data in place. So I think that's very well focused. Okay. Okay. Great. Uh, yes, really great to see all of this. Um, so if the question was what's missing or part of this question is what's missing. I think um, in looking at it with the short term, medium term and long term, which is a helpful layout, the short term has four of the six that don't have any um, any measures. So that's the only one, actually. I was just double checking. But that's the only one where we don't have any measures is in those short terms and that's in the majority of our, of our areas. So I think between that and the community survey, emphasizing the need for communication, which mm -hmm. is the near term, the communication and awareness is generally the near term output mm -hmm. that we need to both have measures for that and then also ramp up. Okay, fantastic. Uh, Zach. Uh, thank you. 
<clears throat> so um, I was able to kind of crosswalk some of the most, the needs, most emphasis areas from the community survey with um, outputs. So I went through like each category to see, okay, do the needs, most emphasis areas align with outputs that we currently have documented and then try to identify kind of noticeable gaps. Um, and, you know, there are probably some internal measures that might, might better fit um, what we're seeing from the community survey. And I think there's probably some value in thinking through potential essentially changing outputs or adding outputs to align with how the community is thinking about things through this community survey. Um, but again, this is also just kind of a thought exercise. And I'll throw it out there. We don't have to necessarily do anything with it either. So, like, for example, uh, within mobility, traffic calming measures in neighborhoods is identified, and that's missing kind of an associated output. Um, within growth and, and I'm happy to um, within growth and development, how well a school has planning for future growth is missing an output, and also um, it'd be kind of unclear or challenging to measure that one. We'd have we definitely have to think through um, think through that. With um, also within growth and development, availability and affordable housing uh, is missing a comprehensive output. Now there we have an output for new affordable housing units created. We don't necessarily have one that represents all affordable housing at some definition in the city. Um, within infrastructure, um, condition of sidewalks is missing a similar um, output. Like we have pavement index, pavement management index, whatever it's called, um, but we don't have a similar one for um, sidewalks, and that was identified as a needs most emphasis. Um, within environmental stewardship, quality of water, including streams, lakes, and wetland environments pops up, and we don't have a way, at least on the performance dashboard, of kind of measuring um, any success based on whatever we're doing here in the city there. Um, or more. Uh, within social and economic vitality, cost of living in Issaquah, you know, this one always this one always pops up as it needs most emphasis. And we don't really have a, a very good way of um, or I should say a comprehensive way of measuring um, how this could change based on city actions um, in there. So that might be worth kind of thinking through um, in the same area, support for those in need is also a challenging um, challenging to measure. We have a number of human service program beneficiaries supported through city funding, um, and then uh, percentage of human services partners achieving one or more of their goals. Um, that kind of um, aligns with that, but we might need to think through, I don't know, there might be value in thinking through um, what are the other measures that we have. Although at the end of the day, um, because I think support for those in need could mean a lot of things. It could mean um, how we support our nonprofits in align in alignment with our North Star, the Human Services Strategic Plan. It also could mean the direct number of people that we're connecting with in crisis or um, experiencing homelessness or something like that. So, um, and I know we collect that data on the homelessness dashboard as well, but might be worth thinking through how we measure that kind of in terms of performance of C programs. Um, within city leadership and services, uh, city efforts and encouraging community engagement um, is missing an output too. Interestingly, this rose as it needs most emphasis from the community, and it might be worth thinking through kind of what are the ways, how do we measure that? And um, what are, you know, what, given our, and you mentioned theory, like given our um, like suite of, suite of programs that we have to engage with the community, kind of like what is our program theory there and rethinking that. And actually a lot of like council member was bringing up like the data might, you know, tell us in one direction that you know, we need to do something or not do something. Um, in another sense, the data could also say, okay, this is an area where we need to examine the program theory a little bit more and, and understand the assumptions. So like in logic models, and I always learned it as activities instead of actions or like impacts instead of long-term outcomes. But in between those, there, there are invisible arrows and their assumptions are built into there that say, okay, this action will get us this output. That's less of an assumption. But and this output means this outcome or short-term outcome leads to this medium-term outcome. There are like assumptions based into there. So 
depending on what the data is telling us, it might say, okay, we need to take a step back and evaluate this program theory and say, is this all making sense on its face? Um, within public safety, response to pro property crime is kind of challenging to measure too. Um, you know, we got data from police chief just a few, was it last month? Um, about potentially the reduction of property crime happening right now, but number of property crimes and response to property crimes um, aren't necessarily perfectly aligned. So um, this is definitely an area that 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 needs emphasis based on um, community feedback. So that would be interesting to think through. How do we measure that? And then more generally, as been brought up already, when people respond and say that land use planning and zoning is needs emphasis. I have no clue, no, no earthly idea what that means because everyone is approaching this differently in terms of what that means to them. Um, and there's no kind of shared definition of what that means when you take the survey. So that's definitely missing an output and it's not clear. Um, anyways, th those are just kind of some things when I, when I cross walked on the dashboard and community survey that popped out at me as potentially areas for further discussion about the outputs. Concept of crosswalking. What are we trying to accomplish or what is the community seeing and are we measuring it? Russell. Thank you. Uh, my analysis is not as detailed as Deputy President Hall's. So congratulations on, on putting that here. That was fantastic. Um, uh, Dale, just to get back to some of your questions of are we measuring the right things in terms of the food bank number, um, I, I at least recognize it's not something that we can control, but it's an important measure of, of need in, in our community, and I hope that we would keep that in there. Um, secondly, the debt per capita question that you had, um, I think it's important to still keep that in, even though it varies by councils and what they do. Cities often compete with one another to say our debt per capita is lower than others and use it as a as a, a way to say their city is better than others. And we can, you know, if our measure is high, we can certainly justify it. If it's low, it's certainly uh, helpful in our conversations. Um, next on page five, uh, your affordable housing uh, measure there, uh, same uh, uh, comment that was made before in terms of breaking it down by zero to 30 AMI. Um, some of the measures that the Affordable Housing Council uses, uh, Deputy, excuse me, Council President Wall serves on that uh, committee. Uh, having those measures uh, match up with the measures that we use might be a helpful apples to apples comparison, just so we're using the same kind of data that uh, King County is using might, might be helpful. Uh, finally, building on Council Ray's comment, um, permits uh, would be my category of um, doing something uh, might have changed the results in a positive or negative way that we kind of need to track. We opened our permit center um, after COVID kind of receded. Did that have a measurable impact on the number of permits that we were able to get done, or the timing of those, or did it have no impact at all? We've heard anecdotal stories about um, King County not being open and the assessor's office or the other offices not being open and taking months to do permits um, by opening our permit center, did we provide even a higher level of service and better quality service uh, for uh, people in our community? So those would be comments I have. Thanks. So I'll just ask some of the other discussion questions. Uh, are there any current measures that are appropriate, more appropriate as internal data rather than dashboard items, meaning do they not kind of create that flow between here's our inputs and our activities and here's a desired outcome. Um, another kind of discussion question or point is we're kind of at the point where we have the data and so how do we as a council want to shift and look at what the data says about our progress policies? Is there anything we need in order to utilize this data and make assessments? And then I will just hearken my best Connie impression, but what does success look like? Um, I, I think that is an important element now that we are at this point in data collection of what does that success look like? So, Russell. I have kind of another, hopefully it might answer a little bit of the question there, but just another item that popped into my mind in terms of on page six, we're talking about the percentage of materials diverted from the landfill. 
It's a 70% diversion rate. Um, it might be helpful for us to consider when we do the 70% diversion rate, that's just the amount that goes into the green or, or, or blue buckets as opposed to the garbage bucket. Um, a statistic that might be a little bit harder to get but could be helpful is once the stuff goes to the recycling place and once the stuff goes to uh, Cedar Grove, not all of it becomes compost, not all of it is recyclable. The rates differ between 10 to even 20% on the high end in some communities that also gets put to garbage. So it's a subset of the subset, if you will. To get a better mer a measurement of diversion, if we could get the number that is the 70% and then an estimate of what is actually diverted, as opposed to being put to the garbage system as a secondary um, throwaway, that may give us a better picture of what we're actually doing and achieving in town. So I will, let's see. I think one of the things that I noticed is that there are certain areas where we haven't yet established targets and there were things like car travel time where the data is relatively new. Um, what I'm wondering from the administration is when we're going to have a chance to establish some of those targets and whether we might also pair it with this conversation about, hey, we set these targets, now we have enough data, are these the right targets? Um, because one of the things I'm looking at here is around 50% of the things we're not meeting our targets and it varies by area. Um, but is that because we're not doing as much as we should? Or is it because we've set the targets incorrectly? And so I, I don't think there's an expected answer right now, but maybe the answer is, and we'll come back to you in Q3 and have a conversation. Well, I mean, can I? Yeah. You know, these, everything we're talking about is really meant for you to respond to. So I think from the administration standpoint, we're less interested in the finest of fine tuning and more interested in the so what. Because I think you have a lot of data. Um, what what matters to you? What what do you think? Gosh, this is a problem, and it's a problem because of what I heard on the surveys. Problem with what we're seeing in the dashboard is a problem because I had a conversation in the same way last night. I mean, <laughs> it's it, it, it's the confluence of all of this, and that's what uh, we really hope to do. I mean, we've got Dale now what almost full time um, devoted to this, and so we're happy to continue to refine it. But from the administration standpoint, the most important thing about today is the so what. Because as we, as we start looking at the future parts of this, um, our recommendation would be there's only so much fine tuning to do. I mean, this applies, not that complicated. Um, we really, the administration wants this, the feedback from you as to what you think is most important. We'll fine tune, I guess, is whatever you want. But we really want is what's the distillation that you're making as the elected policymakers of this community as we look at 24 and beyond. Um, that's what's really most so important. So as Deputy Council President Paul was saying, that is mostly that next conversation about the mid biennium budget. But I will express back to you, one of the reasons I ask about these targets is because I'm not yet certain how to understand the fact that we are missing our first permit review time. I don't know whether that is something we are seeing in all communities and it's something that, you know, or whether we're trending in a different direction than other communities. I don't know whether other communities are establishing different targets. And true, some of it could be me just sitting here saying, I really feel like we're not doing our first permit review time quickly enough, and that's affecting housing prices, and we should be doing more of that. But I think there's also a question of, do we have the right data to make that decision? And some of that comes down to trends, and are we setting targets correctly? And again, I would disagree with it. Uh -huh. Just because you think it's important is good enough. <laughs> because you, you bring everything you just said to the table. 
Um, again, we're happy to do all the following, yeah. but I would not discount at all. You look at it and say, I'm not comfortable. That can, that's important feedback um, that we very much want to hear. Uh, because then what our hope is, is that we will come back to you in July, you know, with answers or with observations, not necessarily to go point for point for every measure and say, we're going to move this by 5%. We're going to say, we've looked at fluidity and this is what we're thinking. And we're thinking that, yes, this is good. This, no, this is bad. These are additional resources that we need. We need uh, different policies, whatever it may be. That's what, so I would not discount. If you're looking at it and saying, I'm concerned, we want to know. Okay. Victoria, then Chris. Uh, so I think all, I think the data and the way it's presented is great, of course, but I also recognize that I, really like data and I'm a data scientist in my day job and everything else. So I think for me, the so what could be that I like the way on the human services dashboard, there's a narrative that, and I think that could also be maybe strengthened to to include more like, a, you know, a, a anonymized, but personal stories because not everybody's going to connect with the data in terms of taking away what I would take away from it, something that says we're meeting our human services targets because we've had this many um, positive outreach, you know, 100 positive outreach. I think actually like explaining the impact for one person will make, will resonate more with a lot of people. So I think for me, the so what could be that we do have these targets um, because we need to have targets to know how we're doing against them. But I think for the communication, which is my theme of the day, uh, I think just framing it in terms of this is our interpretation so people don't have to actually um so people aren't struggling to connect those dots because um it's, it's the, the mountains of data and the and the um and the bar charts and everything i like them but they're not for everyone so i think that's just you know, maybe like let's connect the, the dots for people because we are seeing in our we have all of these programs and we're 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 making progress on a lot of them like directional progress whether or not we're meeting the I'm sure less concerned about. I think just uh, showing the the progress that we're making in a way that resonates with people, so they can then participate and you know, yeah. Okay, Chris. Um, two two thoughts. Um, one is I like the, uh, I like Russell throwing his <laughs> name around. Um, the first one is um, I like this so what, but I also want to go into the now what. You know, so so what? This is the problem now. What are we going to do about it? But um, I was really inspired by what you just said, uh, Victoria, and that is um, what we're, we may be missing is some of the why the, behind the data. So when the data changes, why did that happen? You know, what's the story behind it? I, I remember once I saw a budget book and it was like, here's the here's the actuals, here's the budget, and here's the explanation of why the budget and actuals are different. So that gives you some insights into like, you know, was it because something we did? Was it because some external factor? What's driving the change? And so that the the analysis behind the data may be more important than the data itself. Thank you. I'll just add a little bit of uh, color to my permitting comment that may help the administration in uh, the, the way I'm thinking. Um, I was looking at permitting just to make sure that we are in line with uh, Senator Mullet's new bill 5290 and the requirements for timing on that and the penalties that can occur um, if we don't make those timing uh, times those timing requirements and um, as we look at that measure uh, and COVID hopefully I'm hoping that our numbers improved because we had more personal service and better quality of service on there but I, I simply don't know that for a fact yet hope that helps okay so we're ready to swing into so what now what and talk through this. Do you have any presentation on this or is this more? Yep, this is all us conversing. Great. So Council President Hall had put in a bunch of discussion questions, but this is basically where we take all of the information from the survey and the performance measurements, what we've heard in the community, what we've experienced ourselves, and go, 
So what what do we do with all that? So anything else there? Is it just no, I'm going to turn it over to the two of you to lead us in this final 35 minutes of discussion. Wonderful, wonderful. Okay, we've got Barb and Zach. Okay, so just a couple of, of things. Um, I'm looking at the, so we heard that people want us to pay attention to the flow of traffic. And, and of course, in my mind, transit is a big part of that. So I'm looking at the dashboard. And seeing in 2019, we had 3,200 transit boardings, and in 2022, we have 1,103. I mean, it's dramatically lower. We know what happened. We know that that's the pandemic, and also um, the uh, we've lost transit, and we have uh, a safety and security issue on our buses. Uh, so we kind of know why those numbers are so much lower. I'm actually quite shocked that we only had 3,200 in 2019. That's an annual number. That's not a lot of people getting on buses. So I guess looking at those that data and also the fact that our people are wanting better flow, I, I would like us to focus on what we can do to encourage people to get on transit. <clears throat> and maybe our target there or goal is to is to at least get back to where we were in 2019. Uh, but I would like to push us even further than that. But so uh, that's just one. And then the other, just a general comment. When we're looking at the numbers for the food and clothing bank, <coughs> uh, you know, which go up and down. And from what I, I saw presentation last week, they're going back up dramatically uh, this year, 2023. Um, you know, our if we have a really economically strong community, those numbers may be going down, but we always have the question of, are we reaching all the people who actually qualify for those services? So in some ways I would say on that, in that area, I would still like to know more. Um, I think the Food and Clothing Bank does a fantastic job of reaching people, but um, we've got such a volatile uh, situation there with so many more people needing services and not knowing if we're actually even beginning to reach um, a higher percentage of those that actually need the service. Really difficult uh, to figure out. So uh, I guess in that area, I would just say let's let's be more um, let's dig down a little bit deeper into the data for the food and clothing bank and other measurements in, in our social services. Again, the community says they want us to do more to support people uh, who are in need. Uh, and so, uh, and I think that our human services group does a fabulous job of really targeting it and making sure that we're we're making progress in the right areas. But um, at this point, I don't know if we have enough, if we as a council have enough data to know exactly what we need to do additionally. Maybe Wally has something to say about that, but you know, we, we we've done a lot more in the last three years than we've ever done as a as a city. Um, what more can we do, or how much more targeted can it be? Would be my question. If I can respond, yeah. Um, most of our service providers are regional service providers, right. and so just because this is a clause in the name doesn't mean that 100% of who we're serving is from this class. So I think one of the challenges at every social service is sussing out those that live here versus those that are in the area who come here because we have perhaps more resources available than where they live. Right. Um, so I, on the uh, homeless piece, I think we've been able to target fairly well. Right. And the uh, housing piece, the uh, housing assistance piece we have, Things like the food and clothing bank are just harder that way, um, unless we get uh, zip code data. We, we certainly can yeah. talk with them about that. Right. Um, so that that I think is is the challenge, um, and then it's where are the resources coming? I mean, and, and as part of all this discussion, that if there are additional things that are needed and we don't have additional resources, then where do those resources come from? Yeah. Um, and, you know, on the social service side, you're right. Three years ago. We, we were no place, uh, and we have developed what, by the end of this year, could be among the most robust 
uh, social service operations of any city our size around. Yeah. It, it is. Yeah. And, and, and but we've just kind of found the money and did it. So I think the challenge is going to be how do we target on those who live in the spot versus those who come here from other nearby communities. That's what we do. Uh, Zach, Secretary. Okay. Um, well, already crosswalked kind of what I noticed from the dashboard and survey. Um, now kind of take a step back from our budget investments. I think just kind of generally from a zoomed out lens, I'm seeing alignment with community priorities that are coming up from the survey. You know, we're hearing a lot of the same things, um, some at different emphases um, from our residents that we usually hear. I'm seeing some target opportunities for improvement, especially around traffic and public safety. Um, and then, like I talked about earlier, there's potentially some new outputs from measuring consensus more, more consistent with kind of the building in there. I want to just echo Councilman Michelle real quick, though, that it's so very, very few residents are using public transit consistently, but it continues to bubble up with us uh, and needs most emphasis ease of public transportation in Issaquah. Um, so something important to point out. Um, so I guess just starting, what does the community survey tell us about successes and whether those are aligned with budget investments? I'm seeing most of the things that were in the most satisfied for each area are aligned with our budget investments. Um, again, lots of overlapping most satisfied in needs, most emphasis areas that indicate to me, um, you know, keep keep it up, keep up the good work, or it can always be better kind of attitude. Um, when it comes to lots more uh, to kind of dig into, though, um, with opportunities for improvement, um, it's clear there's definitely a desire for kind of traffic flow, congestion management. I see a lot of this showing up in CIP, obviously, which is about to come up. Um, conversations that we're having in capital financing, you bring up uh, revenue options. So, you know, we're having those conversations, but also we see um, bubbling high up is cost of living in Issaquah and value add for tax dollars. So that's going to be an interesting conversation about how to balance those two um, priorities, those three priorities from the community. Um, also, things that we've been doing lately or kind of renewing focus on are things like roundabouts and urbanization and ways to make streets feel more urban, to bring down speeds um, to um, or to improve traffic flow. Um, when it comes to congestion management, um, you know, we're doing regional advocacy. What else can we be doing in that space? Um, and I brought up a couple of retreats ago, like what can we be doing with the county about Isquah Hobart Road? And is that road well managed in terms of tra traffic flow? Um, and how are we having that conversation with Councilmember Perry? Um, public transit and other multimodal options aligned with our mobility master plan. Um, we're beginning um, to, to do work um, on that. Um, I it was brought up earlier in public comment too about uh, public education and just deeper engagement. So some of these things are like um, lots of interest in Walking, I'm so happy to see that lots of people walk. Um, um, why? Why do they walk? And and you know some of these things are, are clearly bubble up the question of okay, why? What makes this attractive so we can continue to make those investments in our community or change course if we're doing something wrong? Um, so those are what I'm seeing under traffic flow and congestion management. Another clear desire for emphasis. Um, that comes out of the survey and our budget priorities is well as budget priorities land use again as we've talked about earlier i'm so unclear to me what this means and what we need to be doing in this space with regard to priorities so there's more work to be done there um next is street sidewalk and infrastructure maintenance um again another emphasis that i see pretty aligned with our budget investments in terms of you know, record investments in pavement management program and a concrete um, maintenance program. We've been ramping up a lot of utility maintenance in our older neighborhoods. Um, so to me, this seems like an area of um, continued emphasis unless we need to find a dramatic amount of, or we need to find new resources for these kinds of things. 
it's traffic flow congestion management might be one we have to have that conversation. Uh, and then, of course, the fourth is police services. Um, and, you know, we've had some successes here as well, um, aligned with this community priority with regard to recruitment and retention um, focus, the new crime data coming in showing some um, better outcomes. Um, but again, an, an area that we need to watch closely as we head into the next biennial budget. Um, I think some of the things that we've done in that space, we haven't necessarily had enough time to understand if that's going to have a measurable impact in terms of community perception um, and actual crime reduction. Um, so something to think about there. Um, again, I think we have some big conversations about potential revenue options and um, how to resource efficiently coming up um, or how to meet the need <clears throat> more efficiently coming up. Um, but we have to also make sure part of that conversation is these two big um, areas of emphasis, which were cost of living and um, value add for taxes. Also, this in, this information that I mean, close to fifty, like like I said earlier, close to fifty percent of our respondents being cost burdened on their housing is um, crazy to me. So, I mean, definitely makes more than me. So I am, but um, something to keep an eye on all those things. So, like those are kind of the four main things: so police services, street sidewalk, infrastructure maintenance land use and traffic flow that come out of the survey in my mind that we need to look at our budget investments and say, okay, are these, are these aligned? In many ways, I think we are accomplishing the goals that we want to, and in many ways, maybe we can be more creative, education, deeper engagement, waiting and seeing the data play out a bit more. And uh, I'll stop there. Great. Victoria, then Chris. Um, well, so in terms of the mid Biennial prioritization. Um, I I think that we are on track for a, a lot of things. Um, also, this survey echoes the past surveys, and I think certainly you know conversations I had in the community. And so um, a lot of that, a lot of the prioritization of the budget was based on I think similar themes to what we're seeing from the survey, um, which has confirmed. You know, the things like the great necklace uh, investment, I think, continues to be really important and really valuable and will contribute to the quality of life for, for people that do want to walk and do want to get around getting ways without public transit, but we don't really have public transit. So, you know, if we're encouraging people to, to get on public transit, yeah. there's you can't get to a lot of places without yeah. public transit. So I think, you know, because that's our reality, I I agree. I, I would love to have to encourage people, but at this point, we also just need to recognize that we don't have options that are reliable or that actually get people to a lot of the places they would want to go. Mm -hmm. So, um, so green necklaces, you know, strengthening our 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 ability to have people get around town by walking, which people enjoy, and you know, also by uh, biking and I think that, that that continues to be a, a big um, a big priority for me, and I think echoed in the community survey results. And I think you know the fact that it is also transportation is important; right? it will contribute to the ability to get around town. Um, so, one thing that nobody has yet touched on that I wanted to mention is on thirty two on the actual the, the website um, is the arts. Municipal Arts. Mm -hmm. And so 2019, we had 600, 673,000 people. It's like huge. And then and then very low uh, prior to after that, which is COVID. So 2020, 2021, 2022 are you know impacted, I'm sure, by COVID. But 2022 continues to be very low participation. I know we also had concerns about the funding for the Municipal Arts Fund because it was from theater, movie theater tickets, um, which I don't know if that's bounced back, but I thought 
that's an area that we might want to consider in the I need more information about it, but I thought that might be an area that we might want to consider in the municipal budget or in the mid biennial budget because maybe we need to think about it differently with new data. And it seems like that situation for the municipal arts fund has changed a lot. And so I'm looking at things that are like in flux for what we should think about changing for the mid biennial. And maybe we have new data. And so maybe we need to look at that. Is there something that has changed with that data? I have a quick response or a quick bit of context, I guess. Mm -hmm. on, I think the, the most important thing to note is so if you think back to 2018, 2019, Municipal Arts Fund uh, supported programs like um, Concerts on the Green. So if you think about the number of people that you could sort of say this really high number is through supporting really big programs that maybe aren't necessarily... Um, they're a little, I don't want to say less uh, impactful, but there's been a shift to focus on smaller programs that are a little bit more intimate, both due to continued health concerns, I think, of gathering large groups, but also just a different prioritization of what are the programs we're funding for this, because we no longer have to support concerts on the green through our, our, our artist fund. So I think that's some of what you're seeing is that, you know, we used to put a lot of those dollars towards pro events and programs that are much bigger that are have continued on and continue in our community. And so I think this is a perfect question of like, is the target the right target now that we're thinking differently about how we're using those dollars in particular? Yeah, it does. And it does say all of that in the it does. narrative. Um, but I still, I still wonder, yeah, maybe it's a conversation about the target, but I also wonder, I know we had talked previously about how do we fund the arts because of the change in ticket and the movie ticket revenue. Yeah. Um, and so I think maybe having that conversation about both how we're funding it and is the funding level getting us to our goal? Like yeah. what is the, what is it, a good goal? Which I think is, is that people in the community feel there are arts resources mm -hmm. available that they can are welcome to participate in right so um yeah i think just looking at that might be something we want to do for the budget and, and just to add this was a conversation the council had with the budget uh we committed that during the biennium we would uh come to you and talk more about that looking at the council's calendar mm -hmm. we determined that all this year is the soonest about uh, will be some time on the council's calendar so in talking with jeff i think it's here, and that's the conversation we've had with the Arts Council that um, our plan is to come to the Council. Uh, uh, the funding for 24 is the same as it is for 23, uh, so the administration committed to keep the funding uh, at the same level regardless of returning revenue from the movie ticket sales uh, tax. Uh, so we'll have those conversations start with, with the goal by the first of next year, having a plan. <laughs> Okay. Do you have anything else? Yep. Sorry. Yep. Um, so I think uh, the other one is um, we have we have emergency response as some of the things that we're tracking. Um, but do we have a metric around people's awareness of disaster? What to do when faced with a disaster? What how to evacuate your neighborhood? So that's something that we hear a lot about. Like I live in Dallas, and there's one way out of Dallas, and you know, how do people? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, how do people? How do people know when and how to evacuate? And you know, get like, mapping their neighborhood, know your neighbor, how many people have participated in that nature. So something about that I think would be good. I think that also ties into a number of the other need for communication um, things, and um, and potentially if if we find that there's I need for adjusting the budget for that based on the community survey results. Um, I think that would be a conversation I'd be interested in having. I think people are continually and with good reason concerned about wildfire and um, for instance. So, great. Chris. So my uh, my word of the day is why. Um, so um, I was looking through the community survey and I'm struck with a lot of things. They're they're very interesting, but but why 
why are those things that people are, and I'm looking at the lower right-hand quadrant, I think that's where the emphasis needs to be, but why are people unhappy with uh, street repairs? Why are people um, unhappy with the value they receive from local government? I'm just picking things randomly. Um, and I think we need to do a little bit of root cause analysis on this to really understand before we start talking about what we want to do, let's us understand why this is a problem for people, because it's very easy for us to start treating symptoms instead of really trying to drill to the root cause. And what, what kind of led me to that was Barb's con uh, discussion around transit. And I think it's fascinating. If you look at transit, there's the two flavors of transit. It's, um, it's, um, out of Isquah and in Isquah. And people are not that concerned about regional transit. They're concerned about transit within the city. And that's a very different solution um, than is, you know, getting from here to where I work kind of transit. And and so I think that that's kind of fascinating. And then because uh, Tola is not here, I'm going to um, represent him. The biggest issue that I see with a whole truckload of stuff in the lower right-hand corners around public safety. And and so I, I think of all the things that we've got on our plate, that's an area where people are saying, I don't like our response time, I don't like our visibility, I don't like our um, uh, efforts at crime prevention. And I'm not saying we're not doing great stuff. I just want to understand why people feel the way they do. What, what What's driving their sentiments? Because um, if we're doing, the, we're doing the right stuff and people aren't feeling it, then... We're not we're not doing all the right stuff. So um, so I don't really know that I have any specific things to focus in on, but I really do want us to spend some time. And this is, I guess, an ask for the administration to dig into each of these things that's in that lower right hand quadrant and 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 do uh, you know the annoying. You have a how old, Wally? Six? No way. Uh, anyway, um, you had an annoying four-year-old who always asked the question, why, 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 why? And I want you to channel your inner Wally. <laughs> your inner Wally four. But, but seriously, you know, how do we start to ask those questions and dig to, the, to what's the underlying thing that's driving this, this, this sentiment that's coming through? Because there's some of these that are pretty, pretty loud. Um, and, and I want to do that before we say, oh, well, this is where we want it best. So that's my ask. Before we go to second round, I'm just going to take a moment to comment because mine aligns a lot with yours. Mm -hmm. I love the idea of taking every single one of the areas that's in that important satisfaction um, quadrant and creating root theories of cause. The idea of so what, why, what are we going to do about it, or what do we think is causing that. Toward that idea, I also like, connected the dots between traffic congestion being a problem and people saying they wanted more internal is above transit and taking into mind okay what are they ultimately trying to accomplish they're saying it's hard to get around town somewhat with a single person occupancy vehicle i want another way that gets me to the places i want to go and they're identifying transit as that solution maybe that's the solution well, maybe that's a solution, but maybe other solutions we could look at are electric bikes or other ways to get around for the people that have needs. So I'd like to explore that theory of, yes, we can't control necessarily internal ISQA transit, but... We should be doing more advocacy there. We also should explore other ways that people can get around town that aren't just vehicles. Um, and so I think this this data and survey emphasizes that. Um, I'll emphasize communication. There were a lot of comments about not understanding what was going on. We've talked about a lot of the things that we want to be able to do is create awareness. And so the lack of the ESCO press um, Means we need to take it into our own hands. Regarding permits, I will say I am not satisfied where we, with where we are. I would like to create a strategy for how we prioritize permits. Do we have a theory over which permits get us the most of what we want? As an example, the trend is we're moving in the wrong direction on the number of or percentage of housing units within a quarter mile of transit. Do is a re appropriate reaction to that, that we may 
zoning changes, or is the appropriate reaction to that that we prioritize permits that are within areas of transit? Similarly, Bellevue has decided to put affordable housing first in line with um, permits. Do we have a theory around that? Um, and so I'd like to have a better understanding of why we're making the permitting decisions we are, whether there is a potentially a better, better strategy and how we compare with other cities. Um, and then two other areas I'll emphasize maintenance. I'd like to know what our sidewalk conditions are. That goes back to that whole idea of people won't be able to get around town. Um, so I'd like to know what our sidewalk conditions are. I'd like to know what our bike lane um, conditions and availability are. And then land use. I just don't know how to understand when people are saying that they're dissatisfied with that because I think everybody has a different interpretation, but we need to get a better, a clearer understanding of how we as a city and council are going to interpret that and take action on it because it's obviously an area of dissatisfaction. Okay, or round two. Uh, okay, just a clarification and then I'll... I'll another comment. Um, part of the problem, we have a really good plan for improving um, in-city transit, um, but <laughs> remember that discussion we had about the plinths? Um, it's all tied to the East Link, um, and uh, when East Link comes across all of those nice plans for Metro for improving our inner city transit will go into effect, but it keeps getting pushed back and pushed back and pushed back. And now we've got the plinths that they're replacing. So, and Andy, I'm looking at you. I think it's 2025 or even 2026 now. 2025. Oh, thank you. Or not 20. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, some of this stuff is out of our control in, in that we've got a good plan. We've got a good solution for improving the round town um, trans transit, but there's nothing we can do to get it. I, you know, I mean, I, we could go and throw ourselves on Metro's table and say, please, please, please. But until they get that East Link going, um, and with the light rail, uh, we're kind of stuck right now. So, Andrea, you can. Yeah, I just you can correct me. I, I don't know that it's that dire um, because we are we are working on a program with the Metro Flex program. We're gonna come. We have a. We're working on the contract right now. We're gonna uh, go to tab uh, with that in I think June. Uh, so it's coming, and we'll be. And that focuses on intrust transit. Yeah. And so looking forward to having that conversation with council and talking about that. But it's it's not as doom and gloom as we can't do anything. We are actively doing something right now. Yeah, I know that staff's doing a great job. Um, and then the other thing, and the other place where I want to say staff is doing a great job, and which makes it a, a little bit difficult again to know what to do is communications. I think our communications staff does a fantastic job. And what do we have? Two people or three people on each or two, two. And they just pump out huge amounts of information. And I follow on Twitter and I follow on Facebook and I follow on, you know, and it's just all the time. So it, it's, uh, you know, again, the I think the thing that, um, that Lindsay said, uh, we've got to drill down. We've got to ask a little bit more. You said the same thing. Why is it? I know it's in, we're in an era where it's very, very difficult to actually reach people. It's just like a wall. You have to punch your way through to actually touch people with communication. We've got to kind of figure out how do people want to be communicated with and, and um, you know, how, how can we reach them better? And it's, it's a tough question. Because our staff is doing a great job. In my opinion, they're doing a great job. So, so, uh, but obviously we're missing some loops here in terms of people understanding what we've done over the last two or three years uh, in the areas that they're concerned about. Oh, oh, sorry. Yeah, <laughs> <just waiting. laughs> oh, Chris Ferris, then Zach. the president like to take your <laughs> um, I'm, I'm going to um, have very similar thoughts to Barb in terms of some of the challenges, which is if there are things outside of our control, then what we can control is the narrative. Mm -hmm. And how do we get that narrative out, the right narrative out? Um, and then that led into the next thing is it's not for lack of effort that we're not getting that narrative out. 
So how do we take a step back and say, how do we meet people? And we've done a lot of good things. I mean, I, we've done so many things that are just like crazy innovative, I think, in terms of how we've tried to engage with the public. But we just need to do more because mindshare is hard and there's so much going on in the world and no one really cares about city government until it doesn't meet their needs. And so we'd like that not to be the case. And so how do we get ahead of that and make people, you know, a larger, there was not, I mean, that's a, that's a gross general generality, but how do we get more people to, to how do we get to more people? It's not to make them care because that's not our job. But how do we make it uh, something that they care about? Yeah. So I'm completely in line with you, Bart, on that one. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Similarly, this is making me bring up, I mean, um, at the Mobility and Infrastructure Committee, um, we've been focused a lot recently, I mean, at least over the last year, this calendar year, on how can we emphasize East Point around town or East Point in town? This is definitely showing up in the survey here. Transit is one way. Um, I think electric scooter pilot program would have been another way. There are, you know, other areas of emphasis that we could be looking at, small and large. So what are the small things that we could potentially look at in this mid by? And if not, you know, how do we approach the next biennium? So um, the um, traffic, the, oh, shoot. Emily, you were just at a committee. Isabel was managing this program. Intelligence ITS. Yeah. ITS is another way of doing that. We we asked the direct question: Is this going to be able to help us collect data and make decisions about um, how we can get people around town or people through it? And the answer was yes. So there are a lot of ways to approach this, um, and we're doing a lot of it. But the community either. Uh, there's a couple ways. The community either doesn't know we're doing it or the pace is just not at a fair expectation, which I think it could be both two of both of those elements. Um, the other thing, because I love that so many of us have, have kind of dug into, we need to ask the why. You had brought up, like, we have the ability to potentially have focus groups with these people. Is that something that the administration is um, interested in? interested and willing to do? Is that something we could potentially do by the next biennial budget? What would, what would that look like? Well, I mean, again, thank you for all this. Um, our plan is to come back to you again in July okay. um, with sort of a response to today. Okay. Um, so part of that is going to be, you know, a strategy or strategies or, or a building box or strategies. Again, I hate to be Debbie Downer, but all this is good <laughs> money. And as we evaluate uh, any uh, mid biennium changes to the budget, uh, which we'll start doing after today, uh, we, we've got to start that process. And we need to know from you what you're thinking, because then that begin, has us start looking at more revenues. I haven't heard anything that the community or the city council thinks is unnecessary and that we should eliminate for municipal services. So assuming that we're not going to eliminate or reduce any municipal services, um, how are we going to deal with this issue? So our hope is that uh, you all will be available at the end of July to have that discussion, and then from that meeting, we'll inform any uh, budget amendments, changes that we're going to Oh, yeah, it'd be great to hear if it would be possible to do some sort of like mm -hmm. Thank you. So just to rip on that before I go to Russell, um, our next retreat is currently scheduled for July 29th. So it should be on all of your calendars. Um, at this point, I think we're planning kind of a continuation of that budget discussion, maybe with more data around what's available and what the administration might do. Um, the other question I wanted to ask there is last year we also did a barbecue the evening before at Confluence Park with the senior leadership team, wondering if there is interest in doing that or something different or similar, how useful we all found it. But it was fun. There were some real talented Jenga players there. <laughs> yeah. Okay, well, get back to us over email so that we can kind of decide. But at this point, yes, next um, next retreat is scheduled for July 29th. So. Does anybody know they have a cruise to 
Alaska or anything at this point on the 29th of July. Okay. Do you have a cruise to Alaska, Andrea? Not on the 29th of July. Oh, yes. Yeah, that was sooner. So, okay. going to Alaska. In August. Okay. Um, okay, so Russell, and then we're going to close up on you. Thank you. Um, after this legislative session with ADE reform, CEPA reform, missing middle housing, and um, a permit review, it seems that there are, are going to be a number of funded and unfunded mandates that will be coming down to cities. Um, Commerce is going to give some guidance in its rulemaking through the planning. Uh, King County planners and our planners have been in on those meetings. Um, I think that when we look at the, the matrix, land use planning and zoning uh, is one of the, the, you know, the higher importance, lower satisfaction numbers that we have in there. I believe that this new legislation is an opportunity for us to be innovative, get ahead of the curve and do some things in Issaquah that can have uh, long lasting impacts. I think we underestimate the long term impact and overestimate the, the short term impact that's going to happen. It's going to be a long term game for us. Um, so that's a short way of saying I don't think these numbers are going to change drastically in the next year or year and a half. But if land use planning and zoning is a big one for our citizens, we have an opportunity through this legislation to do some things on the council. Uh, the, the community is behind in terms of the survey numbers, but we have many people that come to council meetings that say they're against and they're very vocal about it. But the legislation for the state gives us, gives us some protection to say it's not us doing it. The state is mandating that we do it. This is the best way that we see to manage the growth and account for the people that are here. And that's the short way of saying for the administration, I hope you would do everything you can to find innovative ways and ideas that we can use uh, to meet those uh, land use challenges and to meet the availability of affordable quality housing, which is also a growth and development opportunity for improvement along the way. And um, also uh, address the climate change and global warming efforts by having houses that are replacing, energy efficient houses that are replacing um, not as much energy efficient housing that's currently in our stock. So if we're taking out a, a house that was built in the 1950s and are putting in a, a house that's energy efficient or, um, you know, built green or REIT or it's LEED certified, whatever it might be, sorry, excuse me. Um, you know, then we're promoting energy efficiency by reducing the amount of greenhouse gases we're using as a whole in the city. Also, if we are doing ADUs, either attached or detached, we're not using as much for new infrastructure, or if it's an attached ADU, uh, we're putting an energy efficient piece onto perhaps an older house that's going to also reduce greenhouse gases while still giving us the infill uh, that we need in these areas. So bottom line, all this legislation gives us an opportunity as a council and staff to put forward things that are innovative and different that meet many of the different categories that we've got here. Um, it's going to need to do funding. Wally, I certainly recognize that. Commerce is going to give us some funding along the way, but uh, I think this is an opportunity for us to really transform Issaquah to account for the people that are here and do the infill growth that we're seeing so uh, often in our surveys and uh, perhaps to the affordable housing piece for the zero to 30 or 30 to 60 AMI, whatever those numbers might be along the way as part of the new housing that might come in. Uh, go plus one, then go Victoria. Um, yeah, I, I also very interesting comments. And on that, we do have funding. One of the biggest items that we prioritized for funding at our last retreat was the Title 18 follow up whiteboard list of which um, the zoning and the land use decisions around how we get missing middle housing and how we get the smaller unit sizes, um, condos and apartments um, that that meet the community's vision. That was all in there. So I think we're I think we're ahead of the curve in terms of having that in the budget and prioritizing that. But I do think some fine tuning now that we know what's coming down from the state um, would be would be good. Um, and I also agree with and like the comments on, you know, when we have duplexes and triplex, fourplex, these are more energy efficient buildings, they're sharing walls, and, you know, that's all that's all aligned with our climate goals, which is great. 
Um, so I have one more comment, which is on the focus groups. Uh, so I think we have a ton of data here. It's statistically um, valid. And I, I mentioned earlier my concern about the follow, you know, the, the people that are interested in following up. I think that could be useful, but I also want to just um, say, I think we have a ton of data to work with here. We have limited bandwidth at the city. Um, so I also, when I first started on council, we were, uh, we had done a big outreach. There had been a big outreach program actually in the neighborhood I lived at at the time, six years ago, which is Squawk on, um, on like a shuttle. And so they had done a lot of outreach to the community and gotten a lot of survey results and had workshops and talked about having a shuttle and people were super excited about it and given all this feedback. And there was also a similar effort in TELUS around the same time. And then nothing happened. And it's six years later and we're talking about like, let's find out you know, mm -hmm. how, how we're going to do a shuttle and maybe have a focus group. So I want to emphasize, there's also, I think, a risk of survey fatigue. People don't want to get, you know, have to do a lot of surveys and give you a lot of information if there's no, if, um, so we should be careful, I think, especially with things like that to I remember saying at that time, I thought we should be careful about survey fatigue because I had little kids with a stroller on squat or no sidewalks. I was like, this will be great. And then, oh. <laughs> and then six years later, we're sort of talking about the same thing. So um, I just want to be, I want to be careful about that. And I think given the limited priorities, also just targeting what we're, what we're focusing on communication, we have limited bandwidth. Um, limited number of staff people. So again, I said this before, but I think like what is the information that people people would like information on lots of things, but specifically what do they really need information? One of our core responsibilities is around public safety and emergency preparedness and disaster preparedness. So how do we get those messages as a top priority to people who need that rather than you know they they might like information on lots of things, but I think we should prioritize more if we have a budget. Right. Okay, we are doing quick and good on time. I will uh, just be able to say anything you wanted to kind of do on wrap up because we also need to just ask if there are any comments or questions on the first quarter reports on the citywide work plan or capital projects. My only lingering question is around the mm -hmm. prioritization list. If there's any if there's anything I know we have that list, it was the list we had previously. It feels to me a lot of our conversation has been around information and engagement. Like there's some elements of, hey, we're, we're doing a lot. And how do people know if we're doing it? We we know the things we're doing and now we've got the data to know some of the stuff we're doing. But that's not lar largely disseminated. I think that a, a parallel conversation is, have it, has anything changed with that list? Yeah, right. well, so, well, let me let me yeah. refer you. So I, I think Councilmember Ray had a good suggestion, and if everybody buys in, then I think I would propose that's the way to go. Mm -hmm. And that is that we take the list of the um, opportunities for improvement, that bottom right hand corner box, and that is the the corpus of our work over the next few months to come back to you in July. Mm -hmm. I think that covered everything that we covered this permitting, the permitting is part of the larger land use thing, yeah. emergency preparedness. I don't think was part of that. So maybe we add emergency preparedness to that list other than what's in that bottom corner. But that, that would be the, the work of that. And then what we would come back is with the administration's assessment, how many, and let's all make a group together, probably half a dozen maybe, and we group together some of the, the communication of the transportation pieces, transportation being one, but there's probably mentioned four times in different ways, that we'll come back uh, in July and give you our assessment. Either here are programmatic strategies, here are resource issues we've identified, here are additional questions for you, um, and have that be the, the main part of what you talk about in July. Does that make sense? If I can just put out as a thought piece, reduced property crime is a priority two on the list and only got four dots or whatever it was. Given the number of crime, property crime, safety, things that we saw in the survey. Um, I think that one of the things we should have on there is a conversation about whether or not that one perhaps needs to move up. Well, I think so, it's in the bottom. Yeah, yeah. yeah. no, I'm yeah. saying on the, when we when we were talking about the prioritization list, 
Yeah. It's on a level two one. And I know it's That's on. Probably, yeah. Yeah. And I think what I'm hearing then is. One of our jobs in July may be to take the previous biennium budget prioritization, the information that's going to come from the administration about all of these important um, satisfaction quadrants and utilize it to create maybe another set of prioritization or respond to what the administration thinks they can do with the resources available. Because there's a lot, I mean, obviously, crime, transportation, communication. Um, those are the three things that I, I haven't been taking notes, but yeah. I mean, those are those are the three things in my head. Um, and so we need to come back with strategies. And again, I'm concerned we got to pay for it. Um, and and I and, 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 and I don't know that it's worth trying to have a discussion that says let's cut back on X because I don't think that's probably a useful thing. So we'll just we'll work on that over the next couple of months. Chris, yeah, I just wanted to comment on that because I think. We can't not cut back on X. And so um, sometimes as important as your to-do list is your stop doing list. And so if there are things that you can identify as you're going through this, like we're doing this and maybe we we shouldn't, um, that would be very helpful because th then we can get some, some feedback. And like I said earlier, and it's very true, government has a horrible time stopping stuff because because there was a reason you started it and you don't want to you know abandon that reason. But ultimately, you got to uh, make some hard decisions. So. Help on that area would be super well, helpful. And, and you all need to take credit that you spent the last three years making our decisions. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, really, only in the last five months <laughs> have we been able to make easier decisions because we haven't been in the midst of the pandemic yeah. and we've been very aggressive in reducing expenses. You know, we looked at a lot of things. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I think we're generally okay. Um, but uh, you have all said the bar mayor, Polly, who's sitting so great. Right right right. right. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> I, I want to comment on that. Yes, I mean, so the mayor, go ahead. You're going to say what Thanks. I was going to say. Hi, everybody. The farmer's market is off and running. Yeah. <laughs> I brought you some amazing specialty cookies. I think there's 13 of them in there. Please don't pass them by. They are delicious. They're from a new vendor. So what I wanted to just um, add a little background on Council Member Ray's comment was that as horrible as the pandemic was, meaning we stopped doing everything we were doing and only did what we needed to do for the pandemic, it was an incredible opportunity for every department to look at what they were doing and bring back only the things we wanted to continue doing. So I'm sitting in the back talking too much to your director of Parks and Community Services, but I was paying him a compliment because one of those things that we changed that we hadn't had before was we now have a recreation supervisor for adults with disabilities. Mm -hmm. We have focused in on a need the community said was missing and moved things around to do that. So we did not come back the same after COVID. Even our department alignment is not the same. So um, I probably back in the day did not do a good enough job telling you or describing to the community the changes, but as much as it was hard, it was an amazing opportunity. The one big example you've probably seen is the um, reallocation of resources to human services. We went from one to six, now we're looking at more. I mean, we really learned some lessons through COVID that we had to come back and do things differently. So I don't think you're going to get a list, Council Member Ray, of things that we want to put on. I know, look, he's sticking his lip out on the chopping block. Um, we've really tried not just to go back and do what we've always done. We tried to learn lessons from the pandemic. Now I'm going to go sit in the back and watch <laughs> Okay, and I am going to see if I can kind of close this out. First question is to the administration, did you get what you needed? to take us at least to that next retreat? The only thing I would even ask is you're not going to do this. One priority, everybody. I mean, if you got to boil, because there's a lot here, yeah. and I, I, I think we we need a little bit more. It's a little bit more. So is it one priority to change, or is one priority even more? Well, you, you define it however you want. For everything you've seen today, everything you've talked today, as we look at adjustments for 24 what's what's top of mind so this is for adjustment so it's something to, to adjust from the current priority uh, you define it whatever <laughs> what 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 are what are you ending this discussion what's the top of mind topic you, you just define it harvest permits thanks 
That's where you go. Oh, oh doesn't matter. You Call in. Yeah. Well, no, it's just you that was basically around the room. Um, ease of movement around town. I'll go with that too. And can I just say that I commend uh, the administration for the, I ordinarily I would say human services, but I really think the administration has done a, a really fantastic job in, in meeting the needs of our community. So I'll go with ease of travel around town as well. Police services, I challenge every council member to do a ride along in the next six months. So we understand the problem, we understand the challenges our police department has, and we best understand what we can do to try to fix it. Public safety with an emphasis on policing. Emergency. And I'm sure you will have individual conversations with all of us and council member Martz on, yeah, kind of getting all of the details on that. Um, okay. So any reactions on the first quarter reports or if you don't have time at this point, maybe emailing them off to either leadership or administration, anything coming up? You're, yeah, doing, a good you're doing a good job. Doing okay, a good job. great. <laughs> Yeah, and I will say that Zach and I have committed to um, reviewing that work plan as it relates to our council schedule to make sure we're just keeping on track of everything. But we would love it if you would just take some time after the meeting to look through all of that. And at this point, we are only 10 minutes late, which we started 10 minutes late. So I'm going to say we're so keeping on. Yep. So we have a lunch break until about noon, um, and then we are going to head out on our city bus tour. So I will take that. I will take that moment. Eat like you're in middle school. Middle school is only going to be twenty minutes. I mean, I thought we were planning on just giving you oxen. Thank you, everyone. Really appreciate it. As always, email us, Issaquah, or city council at Issaquah.com.